James, Scott Angeles is here. And Emily? Still can't find her. Call her dad. Whenever something terrible is about to happen, she's usually at her dad's. Sure. Coffee? Xanax? Yes. Great. We're up in five. Great. This is gonna be... I know. Anything else I can get for you? Yes, you can tell my therapist to clear her month. <laughs> Scott. Good to see you again. James Locke. There is something different about you today. Emily's working a story, so I'm gonna be interviewing That's you. That's it? Today. You are sober. So, uh, so Emily is working a, working a story, so I'm gonna interview you today. Happy to trade up. How you been, big guy? Tired. You know, Emily's story's a big one, and I've been up all night, you know, trying to get it out before closing bell. Hey, uh, congrats on the new book, by the way. I tore right through it. Thank you. I was just in Bimini celebrating with my lady. It was a real kick seeing everyone reading it on the beach. Yeah, I'll bet. You ever been to Bimini? You know, I thought it was a type of coat until just now. All right, everybody, let's settle in. We're on in 30. All right, so we're going to do this in two live segments. I'm going to start out with some general questions, then get into the book a little bit, and then probably ask Coming a few questions about 10, TGF's latest earnings. Nine, okay, great. Eight, seven, six. Five, Are you ready? Four, Are you? Three. Should I just start or? Excuse me, I swallowed a bug right before we went on the air. <laughs> He's been called the Prince of Wall Street, but does Scott Angelis, prodigal son of Transglobal Financial Chairman David Angelis, and the youngest chief investment officer in that bank's 50-year history, have the charm to make it in the family business? He's out with a new book today, Trading Up. Scott Angelis, welcome to the program. Thank you, James. It's good to be with you. That's a great tie. Thank you. So let's start with that nickname, the Prince of Wall Street. Sure. It's a lofty title. Does it come with a crown? No, it comes with power and money. I already had the crown. Belated congratulations on your recent marriage, by the way. Thank you. You broke my heart, Locke. I really thought that we had something special. <laughs> your father, as I mentioned, is Transglobal's Chairman David Angelis. What is it like working for Dad? It's a lot like when I was growing up. He gives me lots of money to play with, and I try not to disappoint him. How do you respond to critics who say it's a conflict of approximately $350 billion, approximately 15% of the firm's total assets, and my team and I trade those assets to earn money for the bank. But there are critics who and say that... And I make that sure that whenever TGF takes a risk, that we're protected. Protected by me. Not my father, not my grandfather, and not the government. By me. But there are critics who say that working for your father in that capacity is indeed a conflict of interest. I work for the shareholders, not my father. Fair enough. In your book, your advice for the street is to quote, throughout the playbook, lean into disruption and embrace risk. Now, do you think that is a responsible position to take in a slow economic recovery? Have you ever seen a child take off a Band-Aid? Sure. They're scared, whiny little things, peeling it off so slowly, one millimeter at a time. But they're kids, you know? An historically stupid group of people. Grown-ups just rip the Band-Aid off. Get over it and get on with it. Well, I'm glad I'm not your kid. But you wish I were your daddy. <laughs> so you don't feel any obligation to be more conservative with your bets, given what the country and the economy and millions of Americans have gone through the last six, seven years? Not at all. Yellen's still making it rain with free money, son. Quantitative easing is the rich man's welfare, so why waste free money on being conservative? Well, that's an interesting spin. So what you're saying is that... I'm saying the public doesn't know what it needs, yet everyone still complains about not having what they think they're entitled to. And do you know why that noise falls on deaf ears from my seat at the table? Because at the end of the day, all the people really want is their 64-ounce soda, a couple of scratch-offs, and a house they can't afford. Did he seriously just say that? Well, that is a very broad, degrading stroke you're painting there. I don't see it as degrading, but that's an interesting observation. When I was 11 years old, James, I was overweight. I didn't have many friends. There was a girl in my class that I really wanted to ask to be my girlfriend, and I thought, maybe. Just maybe she would go out with me if I weren't fat. So one day, I asked my father, just a senior VP at the time, if I could go on a diet I'd seen on TV because I really wanted to ask this girl to be my girlfriend. Without looking up from his newspaper, he said, you can't make a thoroughbred out of a plow horse. You can't make a thoroughbred out of a plow horse. Correct. He said it was a loser's bed. And, and it was degrading. And he was right. And I proved him wrong. Well, before we go to break, I want to let you know that I did read your book last night, and it is missing something. What's that? Your autograph. That's my clever way of asking you to sign my copy of your book. Excelsior, James. Very clever indeed. 
We'll be right back with Scott Angelis. And we're clear. Back in 90 seconds. You know, you really did. Hold that thought. Take this upstairs. They want me to do this in the next segment, and I really want to do this in the next segment. They have exactly 84 seconds to prove that I'm right, and then I protect it if we're wrong. I'm on it. Thanks. He's back. I missed you. Yeah. Sad story about your dad calling you a fat horse. Oh, dad loves a good fat horse insult. Listen, Listen I don't know like... what the hell you thought that was back there. The kiss and the... James. Oh, I know you're not hitting on me. The audience knows you're not hitting on me. And your lady watching this at home is really hoping that you're not hitting on me. And I know that you need to win this interview the way that you win every broken human interaction you debag your way into. But it's not really working for you here. It's just unprofessional and it's obvious and it's creepy. And frankly, you're just bad at it, which is disappointing given your reputation. <laughs> You practice that speech in the mirror on your bored husband. Just having fun with you. You're having fun at me. Knock it off, or I'll knock you out. Back in five, four, three. We're back with Scott Angelis, author of the new book, Trading Up. Scott, what inspired you to write this book? Well, James, I believe in paying it forward by sharing knowledge. And frankly, I saw a real gap in the market for young Wall Street executive voices. So had you ever written anything before? Not unless you count a few sports stories for my school newspaper. <laughs> what about memos? James, I've written so many memos that I actually wrote a memo to cut back on all the memos. I'll come back to that. First, I want to switch gears and ask you about TGF's recent quarterly earnings. We beat the street's expectations for the first time this year. How big a role did your hedging strategy contribute to TGF's quarterly gains? Well, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think we helped. A little bit. <laughs> and the losses? You can't win them all. If we had to lose, I'm glad it was only four million. Well, only four million is still a lot of money for most human beings. Well, good thing I'm not most human being. Well, that's good, because while the four million was the reported number, I'm actually referring to a completely different number. Which number are you referring to, my friend? The other exponentially larger number, Scott. I'm referring to the $2 billion in proprietary trading losses that you told TGF's Auditing Oversight Committee to disregard. Whoa, shots fired. FNC has obtained this internal memo sent from TGF's Auditing Oversight Committee to you, CIO Scott Angelis. Just want to make sure that that is indeed you. I believe so. Great. The memo flags a significant accounting irregularity in the amount of $2 billion, which, by the way, is, is a lot of money even for irregular people, in unreported losses that are stemming directly from proprietary trades executed by you while you were the CIO of the TGF Treasury. Well, James, I did rehearse that one, yeah. And right here you'll see at the top says disregard, clearly written in your handwriting, which we also had analyzed and verified using the sample that you gave us before the break. Okay. So what? He's bluffing. He's not. I'm sorry? I said, so what? As if to imply who cares. As if to suggest nobody. I know, I spoiled your big reveal, and frankly, James, I wish that you told me. I could have spent the last few minutes practicing a proper who, me face. Do you want me to take it again? You know, on behalf of all the TGF shareholders who probably aren't laughing right now, I have to ask you, do you have even a hint of a moral compass? <laughs> Moral compasses never point in the direction I'm heading. They're figurative tools created to convince people they're poor because they're nice. As obsolete a relic as ticker tape and car phones. So you feel no obligation to be transparent. Anyone who believes the law is actually a meaningful deterrent in 2015 need only look at the number of executives responsible for the greatest financial meltdown in recent history who have not gone to prison, which is every single one of them. That's transparent. Secrets save money. That's a fact, Chief. Well, this is profoundly unsettling. I completely agree. We were having a nice talk about my book. I opened up about my childhood. I liked your tie. And then suddenly it's the crucible. Scott, is this about your embarrassing moment at the folly? Is it, it's, it's not about that. Not I, that I wasn't flattered by your proposition, Scott, sloppy and Scott, slurred as please, it was. Scott, my girlfriend and I had a great You know laugh. what? This is not about me. This is not even really about you. This is actually about the chairman of a major investment bank who is giving his son a pass for losing $2 billion in the company's money and then conspiring to hide it from shareholders. So, you know, it's actually about securities fraud. This is about no. ratings. This is about pay Page views. This is about ad dollars. <laughs> this is about the media playing cops and robbers, Same. spinning maybes into conclusions, being first instead of right, just to keep the lights up. Are you familiar with the term, didn't you get the memo? Because I quite literally got the memo. Are you sure? I'm sure. You said that the memo had been verified, not the handwritten note, the memo. Now, did you verify this memo personally? 
Or did you just take Emily Harris's word for it when she handed it to you and asked you to handle this interview in her place? Twitter's blowing up right now. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were interviewing me now. Well, I'm asking because it, it looks like a memo that I wrote and I left on the desk in my bedroom knowing Emily would see it and suspecting that she would use it if she did. <laughs> Scott, you, you cannot be serious. I wore a betting man, which I suppose I am in a finance for dummies kind of way. I would offer you one million dollars of my own money right now to short my bet and to prove that I'm wrong. <laughs> no? Oh, James, you were so flush with conviction a moment ago. You're either insecurely insane or insanely insecure. Your memo is a placebo, but you can definitely handcuff me, and I'm sure you'd love that, for poor penmanship. I will admit, the D in disregard looks kind of like a B. Trust but verify. Ronald Reagan said that in 1987. I was two. Still holds up though, don't you think? We will of course have to launch our own internal investigation into what you've just alleged. To get oh, of course, of course, of course, of course. Take your time, our lawyers love waiting. I think the takeaways here, aside from basic fact checking, buy my book, and don't sniff around your boyfriend's garbage looking for stories are, if you don't bend the rules, you don't make money. If you don't make money, you upset the shareholders. You have to feed the beast, no matter how the sausage is made. So greed is, is good. No. Greed just is. We're going to have to end it there. I would like to thank my guest, Scott Angelis, for being on the program and enlightening us with his candid and unsettling insights. Lively conversation, to say the least. If you missed any portion of this interview, you can stream it from our website or on our YouTube channel. I am James Locke, in for Emily Harris. Midday Rally starts right now. And we're clear. Damn, that is great TV. Can we have the room, please? You did your job. I would have given you more rope. Ah, you needed it to hang yourself. Someone should probably find Emily, by the way. She could use a friend yeah. and a lawyer. How do you make arrogance look so effortless? Same way you make empathy look so meaningless. Did your PR flags have a collective stroke? No, they can handle it. Yeah. Hey, we're trending. I didn't think anyone actually watched this show. Great. James, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, Jen, it's not a great time. No, no, I gotta go anyway. Hey, this was fun. Yeah. They need to see you upstairs. It's urgent. Yeah, I know. No, you don't. Uh, give me a minute.